Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Eid Mubarak to all of you who are celebrating, and I hope all of you in the United States had a happy and safe Memorial Day weekend. I am Doug Silliman, the President and CEO of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, and it's wonderful to see the names of many good friends registered for this session. In these difficult times, we at AGSIW hope that all of you and your families are keeping safe and healthy. You may have been following the series of public webinars which we have been hosting, which I'm very happy to say have reached thousands all around the world in the past few weeks. This program will be on the record and a recording will be available on our website after the program. You in the audience are in listen-only mode, but you will be able to ask questions throughout the program. You can use the Q&A function on Zoom by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen and then typing in your question. Please feel free to reach out to us with any feedback or questions. We have a number of webinars planned for the coming weeks, so make sure that you visit our website, www.agsiw.org, and sign up for our weekly newsletter for regular analysis and updates. We have an excellent program for you today to discuss the future of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps after the death of Qasem Soleimani, and we have assembled an exceptional panel to discuss this topic. Joining us today is General Joseph Votel, President and CEO of Business Executives for National Security and former Commanding General of U.S. Central Command and of the U.S. Special Operations Command. General, welcome. Very good to see you again. We have Dr. Corey Shaki, Director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Before joining AEI, she was the Deputy Director General of the IISS in London, and she's had a distinguished career both as an academic and in government, working in the State Department, Defense Department, and National Security Council at different times. We also have Ali Alfone, Senior Fellow at AGSIW. He is the author of Iran Unveiled, How the Revolutionary Guards Are Transforming Iran <clears throat> from Theocracy to Military Dictatorship. And moderating the discussion this morning is Hussein Ibish, one of the best in the business. He is our senior resident scholar at AGSIW. I want to thank all of you for joining our program today. And I, with that, we'll turn the microphone over to you, Hussein. Thank you so much. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to keep my own contributions uh, to a minimum today because we have such a distinguished panel and it's such a complicated issue. We will end uh, precisely at 1030 or as close to precisely as we can. When I do bring the audience uh, in for Q&A, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. It's located at the bottom of your dialog box and you type your questions into it and I will direct them uh, to the panelists. So uh, that will happen after a little bit of opening and a brief conversation. And uh, with, without any further ado, I'm going to jump right into it and begin by asking General Votel, uh, and thank you again for joining us today, uh, to lead us off with an answer to this question. How have recent tensions between, uh, in this triangle between the United States, Iran, and Iraq, and Iraqis on different sides, uh, developed in recent months? And particularly, how have the killings of Soleimani and, and Mohandas and the others changed realities on the ground in Iraq? What is the medium-term impact on, uh, let's say, the uh, strategic equation on the ground seem to have been? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hussein. It's great to be on AGSIW this morning. Uh, thanks, Doug, for your kind introduction. Great, uh, great partner and friend, and I'm very happy to join uh, Corey and Ali on, on this panel. So to your question, I, I think it's important, to, you know, just to reiterate, I think, up front that the killing of Suleimani, uh, Suleimani was, was really a signature moment uh, in our relationship, uh, both with Iran and, and with, uh, with Iraq. Uh, no one can deny uh, that Soleimani's influence was great. Uh, Iran has, uh, Iran and particularly the regime has had a practice of working through militias and proxies and terrorist organizations for some time. And the IRGC is largely the, uh, the you know, takes the lead in those types of things uh, uh, and have been the dominant factor. And Soleimani has been the dominant factor in their foreign policy for a long time. He has 
deep networks, uh, you know, not just in Iran, but in Iraq uh, as well. And he's been, he's largely been the symbol of the Iranian regime and yeah. their, um, and their goals and objectives and ambitions. Um, to some extent, Al Mohandas, uh, you know, it kind of echoes Soleimani's importance on a smaller scale in, in, in Iraq, but nonetheless influential, popular, and very, very capable. I think that in the near term, uh, in terms of kind of mitigating, our focus really has been, I think, on mitigating the near-term uh, effects. Um, I think it could be argued that this initially did uh, perhaps take our focus off of, uh, off of ISIS and the nature of our role and the role of coalition forces in, uh, in, in, uh, in Iraq uh, and, uh, and the relationships that we had. Um, as, the, as the CENTCOM commander, although I'm a little bit dated here, 13 or 14 months, uh, during the course of the, of the campaign against ISIS, uh, we were significantly advantaged because we were good, reliable, behind the scenes partners. And we stayed strictly focused on, on the task at hand, which was the defeat of ISIS. And so this does take us a little bit off of that and that had to be repaired. It made us the object of some public derision. I think we've all seen some of that. Uh, it's caused continuing concerns with our allies and partners. I know as, as even as the campaign was underway, uh, and this was always a constant issue with our partners about whether we were there for ISIS or whether we were there for uh, Iran. And of course, we were really focused on ISIS at the time. And I think we've uh, seen some regional implications that have that have come out of this that have that have that have played out as well. So I think in the near term, uh, uh, what it's really done is really focused on trying to have uh, mitigate those things and get back to where we were in the in the, in the medium term. Uh, I, I think it appears to me that what we are attempting to do is move back to a uh, return to a, a place before Soleimani's uh, killing, uh, whether you want to call it a status quo ante, ante or whatever else you want to refer to it, is get back to a place where we were before then, um, you know, and uh, obviously continue the, the, uh, the pressure campaign, continue to uh, reduce vulnerability to uh, Iranian or Iranian sponsored uh, or, you know, provoked or influenced uh, attacks or activities on, uh, on American forces. But I think we'll also continue to see competition in what I refer to as the gray zone, below a level of conflict. I think Iran recognizes they can't take us on uh, in in uh, in a in a more conventional uh, type of fight, but that will not prevent them from doing this, and we will have to contend with that. I think that what means what that means for us, just in conclusion here, is that we have to we have to shore up our relationships and our partnerships in in the region, uh, not just with the with our coalition partners in uh, in Iraq, but more broadly across the region. We have to always work to clarify our strategy uh, and communicate clearly and consistently as we move forward. And finally, we need to look for a way to get this into some type of the relationship, this uh, issue that we have with, uh, with Iran into some type of diplomatic channels uh, that I think will ultimately give us a venue to begin uh, addressing this. Um, this. I don't think that we will uh, prevail militarily in this until we... Uh, uh, until we get to some type of diplomatic uh, channel. So I'll stop there, Hussein. Okay, that's terrific. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Dr. Shaki, I'd like to turn to you uh, and ask you from your perspective, uh, where should U.S. policy, and especially the military role uh, in Iraq, be heading? And how on or off course are we from that path? And uh, if you could um, talk a little bit about the consolidation of U.S. forces as well, uh, in Iraq into a smaller number of forward operating bases and uh, just the, the way it's in go. I think as Joe's comments indicate, we're pretty far off a successful path with our policy in Iraq. Um, I, Suleimani was, I think it's instructive that Iran's major relationship with Iraq was through Suleimani and not through religious influence, not through governmental influence. It was through Iran's ability to mobilize militia. But part of the way that they did that was having decades long relationships that could bear the weight of trust. And one of the challenges American policy has in Iraq now is we collapsed 
the trust, both through the erratic nature of our on-again, off-again support for the government of Iraq, um, but also not taking Iraqis more fully into our confidence about our plans for the killing of Soleimani. Um, I think both of those things help strengthen Iraq's, Iran's influence in Iraq. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, so one thing is, we are not the trustworthy partners that Joe just said restoring our influence is going to create. And I don't hear much from the administration that, success, that suggests they're on any more um, steady and reliable a path. I agree with Joe's judgments about what should be done. A diplomatic track with Iran, uh, moving back to quiet support of Iraq's success. Um, but I don't see either of those things happening. I'm not sure why the government of Iran uh, would choose to enter into a serious diplomatic track with the United States, given the clear trajectory of the president wanting to write off Iraq and Afghanistan as well, for that matter. Um, Mm -hmm. And the withdrawal from the JCPOA nuclear agreement um, and the move to take uh, snapback sanctions to the UN if I were the government of Iran, I would think things are going pretty well for my interests. And you could hardly imagine a scenario where the United States proved itself less reliable as a diplomatic or strategic partner. So I think the policy is pretty far off track and I think it's about to get even further off track and with tragic consequences for America's security, and the security of the government of Iraq, the people of Iraq, um, and the forces in the region trying to minimize Iran's influence. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that sobering response. Ali, um, let's turn, let's narrow the aperture even more and, and talk about the IGRC in particular, and maybe the Iranian national security establishment in general. What does it mean that Soleimani is not there anymore? And what's the immediate fallout of that change at the top? Uh, thank you for uh, the question and good morning to you uh, all. Uh, as, as I see it, uh, the killing of Major General Soleimani uh, did not have such a great impact. Uh, admittedly, uh, the Revolutionary Guard Quds Force uh, has changed a lot since he became and was appointed the Chief of the Quds Force back in 1997 to 1998. But not all those transformations were because of uh, General Soleimani. Uh, just to begin with the first major shift or transformation in, in the Quds Force in that period, which is likely to have long-term impacts and consequences for Iran's behavior in the region, uh, one must say that Major General Soleimani, in, during his tenure, he managed to establish a multinational Shia army. Now, those militias existed and were divided along national lines in, ever since the 1980s. So you had one militia for the Lebanese, one for the Iraqis, one for the Afghans, one for the Pakistanis. And it was not so much because of Major General Soleimani but because of the necessities of the war in Syria, that Iran was forced to deploy all its militias in Syria. They had no prior experience in in engaging in joint military operations, uh, let alone coordinating with, let's say, the uh, government uh, in in, uh, Damascus, uh, or for that matter, with the Russian Air Force. Yet they managed to do it. And the Quds Force managed to create a multinational Shia army. This is not so much achievement of Soleimani as the impact of the necessities of of time and and space. The other major transformation in in, in Quds Force during Soleimani's tenure, which was not necessarily uh, because of Major General Soleimani, was transformation of the Revolutionary Guard in its entirety into one large expeditionary force. Before the war in Syria, only a very, very small 
faction, small part of the uh, Revolutionary Guard was tasked with operating outside <laughs> of Iran's borders. That is the world's force. However, as Iran began suffering ever larger fatalities, and most of those fatalities were from the world's force, Revolutionary Guard had to deploy Revolutionary Guard ground forces in Syria. In reality, by doing so, they have transformed the Revolutionary Guard in its entirety into one large expeditionary force. Now, the last transformation was the, uh, I would say, the work of Major General Soleimani, and the not will, will change clearly because he was killed. And that is that Major General Soleimani, because of his personal charisma, managed to transform a clandestine uh, secret operations uh, uh, group within the Revolutionary Guard into a major popular mobilization force. This is what he managed to do in Syria. He managed to mobilize Iranians and non-Iranians to participate in holy war. Now, we know today that uh, Brigadier General Ghani, the successor of Mr. Soleimani, lacks that kind of personal charisma. And, and therefore, we will probably not see as much coverage of the Quds Force leadership in the future that we saw during Soleimani. We will no longer see a personality cult of the leader of the Quds Force. However, the other factors, the other transformations will clearly uh, guide Iran's behavior in the region. Iran will use the multinational Shia army in the future because it was proven successful in Syria. They managed to keep Bashar al-Assad in power. That was the express and defined mission of the Quds Force. So we will see more of that in the future. We will also see that Iran's national security doctrine will change because who in the Revolutionary Guard is doing, going to get the promotions and the medals? Those who were veterans of the war in Syria. That mm -hmm. will make Iran create a much more offensive an aggressive national security strategy in which the Revolutionary Guard will engage in more acts of expeditionary warfare. And that, of course, also creates some other problems, particularly in the economic field. Because one thing is that Iran has the will and the Revolutionary Guard has the inclination to engage in, in expeditionary warfare. What can Iran afford it? These are some of the things that we uh, hopefully can, can discuss in the course of the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I think we will come to all of that. Um, but I'd like to, to follow up with uh, General Votel first. Um, you mentioned ISIS a couple of times, but retroactively. Um, there are those who are suggesting that ISIS is beginning to make a market comeback in certain areas and that the inability of the Iraqi state and its allies to, to rein in the PMFs and to um, in, incorporate them successfully into the Iraqi security establishment to gain, c gain control over them again uh, has sort of laid the groundwork for the revivification of ISIS. Can you talk a bit about uh, ISIS role into the future and the question of the relationship between the, the PMF sectarian violence and uh, Sunni extremist uh, jihadism? Well, you know, thank you. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent question. And I think there shouldn't be any doubt that, you know, and I think we've recognized this for some time. I mean, while we were successful in eliminating the physical caliphate, the fact of the matter is, is ISIS never completely disappeared. And we knew that from the, uh, from that time, we knew that it would be necessary to uh, continue to uh, keep pressure on them. And that is what has been uh, that is really has, has been the main focus of the of the campaign now for at least the last uh, you know 15 18 months is trying to keep especially in Iraq is keeping pressure on these uh, on these remnants of of ISIS that are that are out there you know to the to the role that the PMF is playing in this uh, you know I, I think uh, what what we learned during uh, during the campaign was that we had to uh, we had to have a, an arrangement in place, a, uh, a mechanism where we could uh, we could pursue our military objectives, operating in, in an environment that was dominated by uh, popular mobilization forces. Some of which were uh, were beholden to Iran. That that was an important feature of the of the campaign, and we worked very very hard through our Iraqi partners to mitigate that, uh, to make sure that we could do that, that we didn't become the objects. We we had the benefit of sharing. A common objective at that particular point, which was ISIS. Uh, and I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think I'm not 
trying to pass out uh, uh, compliments to the to some of these PMF groups, but they played a role in in the campaign, and we have to acknowledge that. Um, I think an important inflection point came at the end of the campaign here, and uh, uh, it was it was time for the Iraqi government to stand up and uh, and and bring them back under the control as uh, back under control as articulated in the PMF law. That did not take place, uh, despite uh, a lot of advice to the Iraqis to uh, and suggestions on how to do that um, and uh, how to begin transitioning the sources. They didn't. And so their continued presence uh, out in the, out in the you know physical space, I think, does continue to contribute to some level of uh, of instability. They are still beholden, not completely to the government of Iraq. They are you know have been, been responding to uh, Iran. They are in places where they traditionally have not been. Uh, they are helping to foment. Um, uh, kind of the the Shia arc here that uh, that uh, that uh, Tehran has been keen to put in place, uh, going through the the open deserts and being able to link Beirut to Tehran here in all of this, and so they continue to play uh, this role. And in uh, in 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 as uh, these sectarian challenges continue to play out in uh, in in Syria, it, cre it is creating space for ISIS to to regenerate themselves. We already see this. Um, you know, in some areas between the Kurds and the, and uh, and where the, the government forces, the other government forces are located up in the up in the northeast. So I think this is going to continue to be a challenge for us, and uh, and and until the uh, Iraqi government is able to bring them under some level of control, I think we'll continue to deal with this. Yeah, um, the uh, one of our viewers has uh, sent in a question that's exactly what I was going to ask you as well, Dr. Shaki. So I just like before I I ask you the question, I'd like to encourage. Uh, everyone who's watching us to use the Q&A function now to send in questions. We, we've got a few. Uh, we're going to get to as many as we can, so just um, fire away. And with that, Dr. Shaki, both I and uh, one of our viewers want to know, um, when you mention that you expect things may well become um, worse for the United States, more difficult for the United States in Iraq, uh, what do you mean by that? Can you, what, what sort of um, negative developments do you anticipate uh, continuing or, or new uh, negative trends developing? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the reasons Iran's influence campaigns have been successful is that they nurture long-term <laughs> relationships in the region, um, taking in people when they're exiled from their home governments, uh, using religious connections, um, uh, creating structures uh, like the various militia that that folks are talking about and the United States with the erratic nature of our engagement since 2003 and not just the Trump administration but the Obama administration's decision to walk away from Iraq um, after the parliamentary elections had demonstrated that Iraqis themselves we're looking for political solutions to their problem, not sectarian solutions to their problems, and not violent solutions to their problems. Um, so I think the on-again, off-again nature of America's involvement in Iraq, our, our political commitment to the success of political solutions to political problems in Iraq, leaves a lot of space for Iranian influence what I think I see in the Trump administration is a much greater willingness than in the Obama or Bush administrations to believe that you can ignore the roots of violence and still have effective policies. The administration strategy in the region is much more transactional. The president from time to time seems to believe that we can make a deal with the Russians over the heads of political leaders and public desires in the region. Um, and he also several times has suggested that the United States end its involvement in Iraq. So that's not a very firm foundation for creating trust either among people in the region or among governments in the region. 
And one of the things I think I know about um, the evolution of free societies is that people very rarely make brave choices when they're frightened. You have to create a sense of security before politics, before the kinds of compromises that are difficult to make can get made. And the Trump administration is not creating anything like that kind of security that fosters compromise in difficult politics. Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Ali, um, we have a question for you also, which, which occurred to me as well. It's a really a good one. Did you describe very eloquently uh, how the uh, IRGC and the national security structure in, uh, in Iran is being incentivized? To, to reward expeditionary uh, force and, and how the steering campaign is kind of playing a role for this generation that the uh, campaign against Iraq played for the earlier generation that produced Ghani and, and Soleimani and all these sort of uh, heroes of that war. And that this kind of is a self-reinforcing dynamic. In, in a, but what about the Iranian citizens? Is there any sense that uh, they get anything much out of uh, all this activity in uh, Iraq and Syria and elsewhere? And uh, are they likely to just go along with it? Or at a certain point say, well, you guys are getting a lot out of it, but what about the rest of us? Well, that is one of the weaknesses of the Quds Force and the Revolutionary Guard, uh, because there is widespread dissatisfaction with Iran's uh, regional engagements. And that, by the way, there's a very long history of that. Even during the days of the Shah, the Iranian public was against Iran's intervention in the civil war in Oman. Uh, the Iranian public was against uh, and, and very critical of Iran's uh, help to Saudi Arabia to fight against South Yemen. You know, uh, the Cold War, the mini version of the Cold War that Iran uh, was a part of during uh, that era. Uh, so the Iranian public is not supportive of it. The only period of time where there was widespread public support for the Quds Force and Regina Soleimani was during the height of the uh, uh, Islamic State dominance in parts of Syria and Iraq. The caliphate made, was, was such a great enemy in some ways for the Islamic Republic because the entire Iranian nation truly loathed and hated this organization. You mean an ideal and, and, and enemy? They, they truly did support uh, the, the, the Quds Force in, in, in their war effort. As soon as the Islamic State was defeated, we saw a declining degree of public support to the Quds yeah. Force. Excellent. Uh, so uh, a quick question, and this is actually for everybody. So let's see if any of you uh, can answer this. The, the uh, administration, Trump administration, insists that the economic crisis in Iran and the maximum pressure uh, sanctions have reduced the ability of the, uh, of the Iranian government as a whole to fund the IRGC and the QF uh, specifically and transfer money to Iraq. Uh, you know, specifically when it comes to uh, funding uh, QF operations uh, outside, expeditionary force operations outside of Iran, uh, is there any evidence of any impact on that? So I'll take a swing at that one, because when I was still at the IISS, we did a big study of Iranian influence around the region. And we concluded at that time, it's been five months, almost six months since we did the study, but we found no evidence of significant financial constraint over sustained periods of time by Iran. It's actually not that expensive um, as an option for them. And we, um, the Iranian government appears perfectly willing to pass along the difficulties to Iranian society in order to sustain this element of their foreign policy. And the Iraqi government funds a lot of uh, PMF uh, stuff. So it's, it's nominally part. So Ali, you were going to add, I think. But what we, we see is that, uh, yes, maximum pressure campaign is very painful, but because the Iranian leadership does not know what the purpose, the real purpose of the maximum pressure campaign is, they have no choice but perceiving it as a regime change strategy of the United States. And yeah. if they believe that the entire existence and survival of the regime is at stake, they will end up investing significant amounts of money protecting themselves. And the only useful 
uh, instrument that they have uh, is the Quds Force. Uh, we know that the first seven years of the war in Syria cost Iran approximately $16 billion. Now, obviously, Iran can no longer afford to engage in that kind of war, but it is not necessarily the, the way that the future wars will, will look like. Future likes, wars may, may be less expensive, and Iran may finance them in a relatively different way. But the biggest issue here is that they believe that the maximum pressure campaign pursues the objective of regime change, and therefore they have no choice but investing in uh, the world's force. Uh, now, the, the second uh, uh, Analysis, of course, is how long can Iran afford it? And is Iran going to bankrupt itself, just like the Soviets did, uh, by investing too much, defending itself against uh, uh, the perceived uh, U.S. Uh, regime change uh, strategy? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let, let me uh, bring in the Iraqi side of this. The Iraqi economy is, is also in free fall. And one of our uh, viewers wants to know how that would impact U.S. and Iranian policies in Iraq and the Iraqi government's ability to manage militias and or fight against ISIS. And we had a, a complimentary question of, about the Iraqi government's ability to rein in the, and exercise control over Iranian-supported elements in the PMF. So these are, it's a, it's a sort of double-barreled set of questions, but uh, I think we might as well throw them out together. And, and anyone who wants to start, maybe General Votel, uh, if you'd like to address parts sure. of that. And, no, I, I mean, my, my belief here is that it, it gets harder for the Iraqi government to rein in uh, the, the PMF as time goes on. Uh, you know, as, as, as we mentioned earlier here, or as I mentioned earlier, I, I, mean, I think that the sweet spot for doing this was was after the completion of the campaign moved to get on a path that uh, that brought them under the full control of the government of Iraq. And so I think the longer you uh, you you do this, the more difficult it gets. I think we have to recognize that uh, there are, I mean, there are political constituencies, there are political factors in the Iraqi government and certainly in the parliament here that come into play. And this will just become incredibly difficult uh, as time goes on. Yeah. Fair enough. Anybody else uh, want to tackle any aspect of that? Uh, uh, well, I'll take a shot at the sure. economic consequences yeah, of it. Please do, yeah. The, the, the move by the Saudi government um, in its dispute among, among the OPEC countries about production cuts that set oil markets... Uh, falling so dramatically a month or so ago um, has an enormous effect on the Iraqi government's ability to fund all of its programs, not simply its security programs. Um, and that always makes it harder for a government to find ways to address uh, legitimate social and political problems, to fund the kind of forces and encourage the kind of cooperation uh, that good governance requires. So I, I think the choice that the Saudi government made uh, to, to force Russian capitulation to production cuts had enormous political consequences um, for Iraq and also for Iran. I mean, one of the interesting elements is that the solution or the capitulation of the Russians to expect four times the cuts they were initially asked by the Saudi government to make in their oil production, that deal was brokered by President Trump. So a reminder of no, no matter how erratic American policy is, the weight of American involvement uh, is still hugely important in finding international agreements. Uh, and so I think in a, as damaging as many of the consequences of the oil war were for Iraq, there were also both economic and political consequences for Iran that had to uh, be unwelcome reminders that they don't matter, in the, that Iran doesn't matter in the choices of the Gulf states about OPEC levels, that, that the Gulf states can force whatever levels they want, um, including Russian capitulation, by bringing American involvement in. And that had to be an unwelcome 
reminder for the government of Iran. Yeah, it was quite a dramatic uh, show of strength there, if, uh, just in terms of market control. But anyway, um, uh, you know, we've got a, a follow-up question, which is sort of linked to everything we've been talking about. What's the, what's the best realistic outcome of the strategic dialogue, the Iraqi-U.S. strategic dialogue that's planned uh, for later this summer? And I throw that out to any or all of you, whoever wants to take a shot at that. Well, Ali, would, why don't you talk? Oops, I'm sorry, General Votel, go ahead. I would say, I, I think one of the, uh, thank you, Corey, I think one of the key pieces here would be to cement a long-term relationship uh, in, in the security in the security realm, particularly in the security realm, uh, with uh, with with uh, with with Iraq, I think it's I think it's really important. Um, I mean, it's it's my belief, and I, and I could be a little biased because I was a CENTCOM commander, but I but I do believe Iraq plays an, an incredibly important role in the region. It sits at this important nexus right here uh, in the region, and I think having a good relationship with the government of Iraq, being seen as a reliable partner by them uh, and and having having uh, the balance of influence there I think does support our interests across the region uh, and it allows us to you know pursue a variety of other things so I mean in my view I, I think coming out of this was some type of agreement on a long-term uh, security posture uh, and uh, and all the other modalities that go along with that I think is a very very important uh, goal of these discussions. So I, I think there are three important things that should come out of it, uh, which is just to say, I'm delineating slightly further Joe's point. Uh, the first is the willingness of the Iraqi parliament to support continued American military stationing and involvement in the country. I think that's really important after the Soleimani strike um, for the Iraqis to say, despite the difficulties in the relationship and despite not always knowing what the United States military is doing, um, that we don't have a better choice than continued partnership with the United States. Given where we are in the development and strengthening of the government of Iraq and given Iran's choices and either the unwillingness or incapacity to bring the PMF fully under state control. The second element that I think should be really important to come out of the negotiations is a commitment by the United States to continue its involvement and not just anti-ISIS involvement, but pro-Iraq involvement. Um, that putting the security of the government and the people of Iraq back at the center of American policy is going to be really important for rebuilding trust and for creating a strong foundation for the long-term relationship. And the third thing that I think is important to come out of it is a commitment on the part of the United States um, that Iraq is actually going to be a genuine partner, not a subject of our policy, but a partner in our policy. Um, because uh, that will legitimate American involvement over the longer term and return something really important that I don't think we have had with uh, in the security re relationship with Iraq for a while, which Joe mentioned earlier, which is a common objective we are seeking to attain. That the clarity about that over the long part over the longer term is something really important that can and should come out of the negotiations. Yeah, this is a theme of all of your comments today, which is the lack of clarity is, is debilitating. And I, I, I think that's very well taken. Ali, we have a number of questions I'd like to sort of throw at you at once. And uh, if anybody else wants to help follow up, uh, that would be great. They all have to do with the relationship of the IRGC and or the QF um, with other um, governing entities in uh, in Iran, uh, the first issue has to do with whether the killing of Soleimani uh, allowed other agencies, um, the foreign ministry or other intelligence agencies in Iran, to gain more input into decision making. 
And the second set of questions has to do with whether, uh, you know, and how much the, uh, the QF and the IRGC broadly are involved in succession, in suppressing dissent, in internal security questions and all of that. So that's a lot, but it's all related. So I thought I'd throw it at you in one giant package and see how you want it. Thank you so much. These are all very important questions, and <clears throat> we actually have a, a, an expert in civil military relations among us, Dr. Shaki. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm sure that you know all three of us, you know, can can contribute to, to, to the answers. Uh, the civilian leadership in Iran has been weakened for for a very very long time uh, because the armed forces, and particularly the Revolutionary Guard, is uh, the only well-functioning institution in the country. In that sense, uh, Iran is experiencing a tragedy that Egypt and Pakistan and many other countries have, have experienced, where the military is the only well-functioning institution of, of, of the state. The other problem is that the civilian leadership, because of their short-term interests, always sacrificed long-term interests of the state, even of the clerical regime, mm -hmm. because they always ask the Revolutionary Guard to actively intervene to suppress the domestic opposition. And that, of course, is the biggest problem in, in civil military relations. Whenever the civilian leadership actively engages the military to intervene in the process of politics, a president is made, and you can no longer force the armed forces out of the internal political arena. Now, in my opinion, Mr. Soleimani himself did not play a significant role in the domestic politics of Iran. To the best of my knowledge, he was never involved personally in suppression of dissidents. Uh, and I did not, you know, and, and I know that, you know, in, in, in this context, I disagree with some of my, 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 my friends and, and colleagues here in DC. I did not see Mr. Soleimani playing a significant role in, in the question of succession. What I do see is that the institution of the Revolutionary Guards, the bureaucracy of the Revolutionary Guard, uh, more or less controlling the succession process so that the next leader of Iran will be beholden to the Revolutionary Guard. Uh, and, and that may be uh, uh, slightly controversial and, and, and different than some of my, my, my colleagues who analyze the same, the same things. Okay, uh, Dr. Shaki, do you want to add anything to that or should we move on? No, just to endorse it, that all sounds exactly right to me. And I think one of the shortcomings of our policy in Iraq uh, was not under, has been not understanding how valuable um, a tool the civil religious relationship is in Iraq as a counterbalance to the relationship, um, the political activism and influence of the religious establishment in Iran. That, that at times that has proved uh, very important in stabilizing the Iraqi government and reminding Iraqis of the, that uh, religion and good governance aren't, um, unre you know, that they can be allies and forces for advancing both interests in a way that doesn't happen in Iran. Um, and not having that as an element of our policy, I think is a shortcoming given how, um, how positive and supportive of elected officials the religious establishment has been in Iraq and how unwilling to play the kind of dominant role that, that the Iranian model would force on other societies. Great. Uh, General Votel, we have a number of questions that uh, touch on the same set of themes that have to do with <clears throat> the uh, sort of um, trajectory of tensions on the ground between Iran and its proxies on the one hand and the United States on the other hand, and particularly uh, the, the sort of buildup that we saw leading up to the death of Soleimani, the uh, particularly uh, attacks on Abkhek and Khorest, and the, the question of whether there's an incentive for Iran to repeat that sort of dramatic attack, uh, and w why and how we seem to be in a kind of lull right now. So I think basically a lot of uh, viewers are asking for enlightenment on how to interpret the current uh, state of um, kinetic tensions between the two. You know, or, or yeah, I, I think you have to 
Thank you. I think it's a great question. I think you have to look at this like a sine wave, frankly, uh, yeah. that, uh, that, uh, that Iran uh, continues to operate in. I mean, I think what we've seen for a number of years now is Iran uh, testing red lines. Uh, Apcake was an example of that, and there have been a number of others. We've seen some recently in the, in the maritime environment as, as well, and I think we will continue to, uh, to see that over time. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I can completely explain why uh, why we're in the low we are uh, uh, right now there could be a there could be a variety of reasons it could be it could be related to the COVID situation it could be that their attention is distracted and they're looking inward uh, right now and so they're 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 more focused on that than than they might be on doing some of this other stuff but I think it's important to look at it as a as a uh, as a sine wave and I think the the testing of red lines is something that I think we will expect uh, I would expect uh, Iran will continue to pursue. Can I add an alternative Please. potential Please. explanation? That would be great. Which is that the Trump administration crowed so loudly about reestablishing deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Iran with the killing of Soleimani. And I think the missile attacks on American bases were the Iranian government uh, deflating that, that uh, claim. And now that they have deflated that that claim um, and shown that the United States actually didn't reestablish, didn't constrain Iraqi gray zone warfare, excuse me, right. Iranian gray zone Iranian. warfare, yeah. um, that there's no immediate necessity for it right now. Right. Yeah. No, I, 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 yeah, but those are not alternative necessarily. They, they could be complementary. I don't, I don't see any contradiction. I think they're both good. Uh, good views. And I'd like to follow up with you, uh, Dr. Shaki. Uh, you, you mentioned the difficulty uh, or uh, the shortcomings of, of the current policy towards Iran. And the question one of our uh, viewers has is what might the United States be able to do um, to draw Iran back into a diplomatic process, which almost everyone agrees is necessary. Very few people think it's an end in itself. And what are the possibilities, and this is for all of you, is what's, what are the chances that Iran might be willing to discuss not only nuclear issues, but missiles and regional expeditionary adventurism and sub-state armed militias and things like that? And what might they ask of the United States and its allies uh, in response to concessions on those secondary issues? So that's a huge question, but it has been asked. Yeah, and I struggle to find a, a good answer to it. It's what I would ask for if I were the government of Iran uh, is U.S. forces to leave Iraq. Um, and I would make that the sticker price for starting a negotiation. And mm. the Trump administration actually seems to want to do that. And so a starting point for the negotiations could be an agreement between Iran and the United States about the nature and pace of American security relations with Iraq. And that's mm -hmm. a terrible outcome for Iraq, yeah. right? Because yeah. even if the US and Iran made an agreement that suited Iraq's security needs, the simple fact that they weren't a party to the negotiation would demonstrate, would put Iran uh, in the kingmaker's role. Yeah, uh, so I struggle to see yeah. a turn of the Rubik's Cube that gets negotiations going without selling out the interests of Iraq. Maybe another possibility would be restarting the nuclear negotiations, but the seven points outlined by uh, Secretary Pompeo are such a capitulation that I can't imagine Iran would agree to take the first steps in those areas. The United States would have to take a lot of the first steps given that it walked away from the JCPOA. That's, so that's, I guess the best uh, potential negotiation I can think of would be one where the Gulf states, Jordan and Egypt create the framework for negotiations 
uh, and bind both the United States and Iran by having broad regional cooperation and broad regional objectives uh, that could normalize Iran's relations with other countries in the region by dint of Iran uh, reducing its malevolent influence through militia and the Quds Force. But mm. again, I don't see why Iran would agree to that. If I were Iran, I'd feel pretty good about uh, yeah. having kept um, Bashar al-Assad in power by uh, having gotten an outcome not incommensurate with our interests in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, if I, uh, if I may contribute to... Go ahead, Ali. Go ahead, Ali. No, 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 no. Jara, please, please. I'll be brief. I, I think one of the one of the places we could start would be looking for a way to uh, provide a level of communication or deconfliction uh, in some of the common areas. I, I mean, I look to the Gulf itself. I mean, this is an area where a lot of people operate, a lot of different nations operate. And I think just a simple uh, deconfliction line or something between uh, the U.S. and or perhaps the U.S. and some of our other Gulf partners and the Iranians, uh, I think would would be a would be a good first step to, uh, to that could potentially be built upon uh, deconfliction uh, in, in Iraq or in the maritime area or just I'm something. talking about in the I'm not talking about in the uh, in the maritime area. You know, in yeah, terms right. of in terms of how do we how do you begin to build gotcha. a relationship back with them. I think you have to start small, and I think that's a, that is a small and necessary step in my view. But given the political value Iran has rung precisely from being a threat to uh, shipping and operations in the region, I struggle to see why the Iranians would take that step. I mean, I, I don't know, Ali. Uh, if I may contribute, I uh, do not believe that the Iranian side expects uh, or is particularly interested in participating in negotiations on this side of the U.S. presidential election. Uh, after the U.S. presidential election, of course, everything changes. Uh, according to their analysis, uh, either uh, Mr. Biden wins, uh, that will be the end of the maximum pressure campaign, and Iran believes it can get a different deal or or at least reach some kind of understanding with the United States. Not that they expect Mr. Biden to be particularly friendly towards Iran, you know, but, but still, uh, they believe that it is perhaps easier you know, to, to negotiate uh, with the Biden team. And the other option is that uh, Mr. Trump uh, wins the election. Uh, even in that case, the Iranian side believes that it would actually not be so bad. Because at that time, uh, President Trump will no longer depend on uh, support from domestic groups here in America, but also uh, foreigners uh, and, and foreign powers with uh, vested interests in, in the Middle East region. Uh, and once President Trump is freed from the influence of, of pressure groups, uh, including pressure from some of the adversaries of, of the Islamic Republic, it would be easier to, to uh, reach an ag agreement with, with, with President Trump. Uh, who knows, maybe we are likely to see a Trump hotel in Tehran, you know, uh, in, in a few months from now. So what yes, it's I'm struck listening Please. to, I'm struck listening to that answer, which I think is exactly accurate and really smart. I'm struck, though, at how poorly the Iranians actually understand politics in America, right? Because um, one of the few things President Trump is quite clear on is that he hated the Iranian nuclear agreement and mm -hmm. thinks he can, um, thinks the maximum pressure campaign is working. I think they believe it's much more dependent on domestic political support than it actually is. And I think that's one of the reasons that General Votel's uh, efforts to try and turn keys in the lock and find areas for negotiation with the Iranian regime matters so much because we understand we don't understand that much about what's going on in the in the whole corridors of power of in Iran. And right. despite all the public information, they don't understand yeah, very much about what's going on in the United States. No, definitely not. And I appreciate that. I, I want to broaden the aperture a little bit now uh, and throw together several questions that talk about broader regional issues. And uh, as we're 
kind of starting to wind down the conversation um, <clears throat> there, uh, and I throw this to everybody, uh, implications for all of this for Gulf countries, um, including specifically the listener want to know about Kuwait, which obviously has a great deal of um, interest in what happens in Iraq, uh, and also Iran's relationship with Hezbollah and the question of uh, the very precarious future of Lebanon, which is kind of negotiating a potential bailout um, with the only alternative being collapse. And uh, so I, I throw that set of questions out to any, any one of you who would like to address any aspect of the, the Gulf or Levantine um, you know, repercussions of any of this. Feel free. Uh, well, uh, precarious is a beautiful word for describing just how dire the circumstances in Lebanon are now, um, which had been trending um, in a fairly positive direction. I mean, I think the protests in Iraq and in Lebanon were really positive developments, especially because they didn't cleave along sectarian lines. Um, and so they showed that people had broader civic demands of their government uh, in ways that could be fostering of accountability. And neither the Iranian government, excuse me, neither the Iraqi government nor the Lebanese government made very smart choices about how to respect their own publics and build their own legitimacy by addressing the political demands. And mm -hmm. so I think it, it made politics more brittle in both Iraq and in Lebanon. And the financial crisis in Lebanon, uh, I don't see how the government gets out of it. Um, well, by making a deal with the IMF. But being twenty six. Well, million. they'd be lucky to get a deal with the IMF. They'd be very lucky. Like. Well, it's and, the only way. And it... The IMF will, I think, force the kind of accountability that Lebanese themselves were demanding. So right. that would be a good outcome, but yeah. it's going to be terribly painful yes. for the people of Lebanon to, to meet the IMF economic yeah. standards. No doubt about it. All right. Well, we're just about uh, out of time. So I would ask uh, each of you, if you want to make any closing remark, if, if any of you wants to, um, you know, uh, uh, jump off of that broader question about the region or anything else you'd like to say, um, please do it. And then we'll wrap up. Oh, just to oh, say oh, that. Oh, go, ahead. <laughs> go, ahead. go first. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll go first. Then we'll end with General Votel. Ali, go ahead. So what, what we are likely to see is, in many ways, continuation of the operations of the World's Force as we know it uh, from the past. Uh, but I am also expecting to see uh, some difficulties because of the financial uh, hardships that the Iranian public are experiencing and declining public support for, for, for Iran's activities abroad. In part particular, now that we no longer have this prophet, warrior-like figure, like Soleimani, to mobilize the masses for that one. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, General Votel, final uh, two, thoughts? Two quick points. I, I think we have to keep our, keep our eye very closely on, on, uh, on the Quds Force and particularly on the proxies around the region and the partners that, sure. that the Quds Force and the ARGC has had Soleimani cultivated here. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think we know what direction the new leader will go, the new uh, Soleimani replacement will, will, will go in this and uh, whether he is going to try to reestablish that or if he is not going to be able to accomplish that and it means that these proxies become more, uh, more independent and, and as a result perhaps even more dangerous than they have been. So I think we have to, we have to watch very, very carefully. Likewise, I think we have to watch our golf we have to we have to understand how our golf partners are looking at this as uh, as well. Um, I, I think there's already been some indications that they have uh, perhaps uh, seen looked into the abyss a little bit and seen what can yeah. uh, play out in a in a major conflict between uh, the United States and the, and uh, and Iran, and they recognize that uh, they will bear a lot of the brunt of that. Uh, and so I think there is there is some desire on their parts to look for alternatives in this. This may be an opportunity for us 
um, as we move forward. But uh, my, my last point would be, you know, as, as, you, as you have emphasized, and I think all of us have talked about, the importance of clarity going forward is really, really important. Uh, there are lots of other things that the United States is concerned about in its national security interests here. Uh, and, uh, and so clarity in communication uh, on the way forward here, I think, are, are very, very important for us. Great. Uh, Dr. Shaki, you wanted to say something? Just one quick point, which is the country I am most worried for is mm -hmm. Jordan, because yeah. the combination of Assad remaining in power, the Russian and Iranian involvement in Syria that made that possible, the expansion of Israeli settlements, um, and the perhaps reduced willingness of Gulf states to provide financial support to Jordan, and the yeah. pressure of of uh, refugees in Jordan creating economic yeah. strains. That's an enormous burden for a country that has been a very good friend to the United States, a very good friend to the states of the Gulf and a stabilizing force in the Middle East. Oh. It's an enormous weight to bear. And I think yeah. all of us should be more worried and more helpful to Jordan. I couldn't agree with you more. It, everyone still needs Jordan to be Jordan and do what Jordan does, and we forget that. And they have a perfect storm coming, especially with the uh, potential annexations. That's an existential threat. But thank you so much. You, uh, it was a great explanation. Thank you very much, Ali. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Shaki. And thank you so much, General Votel. This has been a great conversation. I apologize to everybody who asked really good questions, some of which we couldn't get to, and it's really a matter of time. So please join us again next time for the next AGSIW webinar. We'll be back next week. Thanks very much.